Early review code for Horizon Forbidden West was provided by PlayStation. You know, there was a period while playing Gorilla's upcoming open world behemoth where this video you're watching right now was going to be titled Why It's Pointless to Review Horizon Forbidden West. After around 6 or 7 hours, it's not like I was having a bad time by any means. I was enjoying myself a fair bit, wandering around the early areas of the game, going from nondescript quest giver to objective marker, picking up the fetchable MacGuffin they so desired, experiencing the all too familiar gut punch of zooming out the map to see how minuscule a dent I I'd made in this gargantuan world. The same things I've done, the same feelings I've felt in countless open world games prior. It also came with the same graphical chops of every one of Sony's now extensive roster of massive budget, cinematic, action focused titles. Those games people often hold up as generation defining masterworks. They arguably constitute a genre unto themselves at this stage, one that I have definitely softened to in the last couple of years, but one that still carries with it an unshakable sterility disguising mechanical rigidity and fairly basic storytelling behind a glossy Hollywood-esque sheen. It's the kind of rigidity that caused me to bounce so hard off the first game in the franchise, 2017's Zero Dawn, with someone making the baffling decision to release it alongside Breath of the Wild, a game whose complete emphasis on freedom of exploration only highlighted Horizon's comparative inflexibility. All of this to say that at around that 6 or 7 hour point, while I was finding the experience of Forbidden West pleasant enough, I was developing the core of this video in my head. It felt pointless to review this game because you already know exactly what this is. A Sony big budget cinematic action open world, and you already know if you're going to like it or not. But then something clicked for me. Thanks to embargo restrictions, I'm not sure I can talk about the specifics here, although the feature I'm talking about was shown briefly in the trailers and featured in the first game as well, which if you haven't played Zero Dawn yet and don't want it spoiled, Spoiled, bear in mind that Forbidden West necessarily assumes you're up to date with all the massive revelations of that game minute one. <laughs> but let's just say I found myself in a situation that was at once visually stunning, yet so unsettlingly claustrophobic, that when I finally emerged greeted with that glorious vista once more, I actually found myself breathing a sigh of relief, with a newfound appreciation for the beauty of my surroundings, while still intrigued by the chaos of what I'd just left behind. The scope of the game exploded for me and had me looking back on the busy work of the last several hours, the interpersonal squabbles at the core of it all, and rambling like a person possessed, how can you possibly focus on this trivial shit when the other stuff going on in this world is so gargantuan, so vast, that it goes beyond anyone's comprehension? And from that point, I was in. I ended up putting in around 40 more hours into the game and came away thinking it might be one of the best open world games I've ever played. It's not simply a brighter coat of paint on the older game either. Several mechanical upgrades have seen Forbidden West rekindle my love of a genre in ways that I could not have expected going in, shirking the negative baggage some might associate with both open world titles and Sony cinematic games in one fell swoop, significantly raising the bar for both going forward. Because honestly, it wasn't just one moment that had this game clicking with me. Just as vital was the mere act of scanning the environment to see a vertical rock face, previously a block to your progress in the last game, unless you could find the right handhold, and witnessing it suddenly burst in a Death Stranding-esque array of bright yellow lines and X's, indicative of the fact that you can now climb so much more than you could before. Not quite everything as was touted by the developers, but enough to make traversal feel far more organic here, like anywhere is at least possible if you work at it a bit. And when you get to the top, you can gleefully glide wherever you feel like, because this game seems to have learned the lessons of its past, and incorporated a great deal more freedom in your exploration here. Far from the simple vertical corridor crawls of games like Ghost of Tsushima or God of War, climbing here is actually a viable, fun traversal option. It's a true game changer. Forbidden West finally is a big budget single player game that takes its cues from Breath of the Wild, only more densely packed, more detailed, and more breathtaking. Seriously, despite some technical instability that remained even after the launch day patch was applied, 
mind, this might be the most beautiful game I've ever seen. Not only in the sense that they fixed it so the characters didn't have that creepy, toothy, half-smile thing going on all the time, although that is certainly a welcome change. I mean, just look at this thing. Once you're on your journey proper, the game hits you with so many gorgeous vistas, so many deliberately placed, tantalizing remnants of our own lost civilization so constantly that it's hard to keep up at a certain point. You're just done taking in one jaw-dropping sight, only for the game to rush you to the next unbelievable thing that you've probably never seen in this fidelity in a video game before. And the thing is, thanks to those traversal mechanics, similar to the sense of wonder I'd get from Breath of the Wild, I'd constantly find myself going off the beaten path and figuring out my own way up a random mountain, for example. The effort to do so, making the view at the top feel like reward enough. You're in control here. You're scaling that mountain because you feel like it. Approaching that gargantuan settlement or imposing mechanized fortress. You're gliding down into that cavernous valley for minutes at a time, taking in the verdant greens and murky swamps all baked in a blood red sunset that's at once ominous and awe-inspiring before being tasked with making your own way back out of it. I would literally spend hours just wandering around because it felt like I was actually meant to. Like the objective marker of either the main or side quest I was on wasn't the be-all end-all here. Nothing in this world is merely distant set dressing. Every single object has been carefully laid out, designed to be clambered upon and analysed from every possible angle at your own pace. It is truly staggering how much work went into this and how fun it is to just exist here. Even in the game's more rigid objectives though, trying to get from one end of a ruined building to the other for example, their layouts are often labyrinthine enough in their own right that that kind of exploratory spark never goes out. None of the awkwardly technical architecture or jutting decay of these environments is off limits, presenting you with many different traversal options, what I guess you could call red herring platforms, that might lead you to some optional loot or might lead you nowhere, requiring you to figure out how to get back, an often daunting task given how far you may have ascended and how far there now is to fall. And sure, it does lead to some navigational awkwardness at times where you realise there's nowhere else to go but back the way you came, but this awkwardness, the game's hands-off approach in letting you get lost from time to time, to make the wrong call rather than being told exactly what path you must take with zero deviation, is precisely what makes exploration meaningful here. It highlights in no uncertain terms that these environments have moved way past humanity. These places are not intended for puny humans to inhabit, which makes it all the more rewarding when you find some means to conquer them anyway. It's world building and mechanics working in complete time Random, and that world they're building is fascinating in how its workings gradually unfold to you through gameplay. See, like the moment I discussed earlier where I felt both wonder and fear, Forbidden West's open world is one teeming with daunting dualities. Calming waves of the sea hide the endless depths and the unknown threats that lie just beneath. The intrigue of pondering how these old world objects came to be repurposed in this environment, quickly supplanted by the existential gut punch that what was once cutting edge technology to us is merely a blip on the larger cosmic timeline. A space shuttle, once a symbol of true exploration beyond what we currently understand, now serving as little more than a club to swat down some bothersome robots. And all of this reflects the core struggle of Forbidden West that makes exploration so enticing. Unspeakable beauty versus the brutal indifference of nature that brought it all about. The constant feeling of being dwarfed by your surroundings and the childlike awe that inspires versus the feelings of of fragility that necessarily come with being so small, so relatively insignificant. Because one of the great things about Forbidden West is that after a certain point, you realise that it's not just the main story whose stakes are held so consistently high. There's a sense of danger inherent to simply wandering around and learning more about Forbidden West's world. You know, Aloy's strong but she's far from invincible, and there was rarely a point where I felt truly confident in any fight I found myself in. There's a kind of uncanny ecology you're uncovering at every stage of your exploration. The delicate balance of all these different beasts doing their thing, with some being quicker to startle and anger than others, and some of the biggest threats coming from the places you'd least expect, taking you by surprise and requiring you to act quickly with your vast array of tools and traps in order to escape. And I suppose I should mention that melee combat in particular definitely has its problems, more or less suffering from the Witcher syndrome, lacking both impact and precision. But it hardly matters when the number of options at your disposal is otherwise so huge. Hell, many encounters I ended up fighting my way out of could be viewed as purely research, simply trying to
trying to find out how these particular machines worked, and oftentimes having to run when I realise they're too powerful for me. Not only does this mean that those few moments of true calm and tranquility feel all the more earned amongst the constant anxiety that something could go wrong at any second, these excursions that could take a significant amount of time in themselves saw my knowledge of the workings of this world developing through my own mechanical experimentation, rather than simply having to rely on audio logs and text dumps, although those are here in abundance as well. Let me put it like this, one of the oddest but potentially strongest things I can say about this game is that the beauty of the visual tableaus you experience one after the other in Forbidden West, and the effort you put in to experience them, even in your most seemingly mundane moments where you've fallen down a ledge and are trying to jimmy your way back round to more solid ground, were so consistently magnificent that it actually inspired a kind of genuine wanderlust in me. The desire to get out of my own comfort zone and experience the wonders of nature abundant in the real world. The game is truly that special. But in actuality, this brings me on to one of Forbidden West's bigger weaknesses in my eyes, the way it handles its larger story. And don't worry, I'm not going to spoil any details here. What I will say is that it's clear that such an appreciation for our environment and its fragility was something that the team at Gorilla wanted to encourage in players, and to its credit, the story manages to avoid a lot of the hokiness that can sometimes come with directly referencing such current cultural anxieties. You know, the game attempts to take aim at the wider sociological issues surrounding climate change. Labour politics, tech weirdos seeking answers in the stars rather than fixing the problems we have here, overwork and instilling fear and isolation in those who don't give everything to their corporations, cults of personality around CEOs. It all gets warped by years of post-post apocalypse into a kind of religious and spiritual fervour, in a way that kind of reflects the almost incomprehensible scale of the threat faced by the world and the internal struggles our protagonist deals with in its wake. You know, even if Aloy stops being so cold to her friends in her single-minded pursuit of her goal and accepts the help they offer, and despite her dogged determination not to give up, how can anyone even begin to fix all these problems? How many old world systems whose creeping tendrils are felt this far into the future, long past the demise of the society they originated from, are going to have to be undone for all of this to stop? And in those questions, you get a few really interesting character moments popping up here and there. The problem is, well, the rest. Look, you know that scene in The Matrix Reloaded with the architect, where a bunch of really wild ideas are presented so inelegantly as to rob them of any potential impact? That's basically what every conversation, every massive reveal in this world boils down to. Completely monotonous, uneventful, shot reverse shot exposition dumps, sometimes up to 40 minutes in length. And after a while, I found myself just skipping past any dialogue option that wouldn't simply move the plot along, so bogged down as they were in telling rather than showing. Because that's the thing, these conversations just feel so constrained, so blinkered in comparison to the world they're attempting to explain that lies just out of view, just waiting to be discovered and clambered over yourself. When you're released of those narrative shackles, as much as they occasionally illuminate the all-important stakes of everything here, it really says a lot about how amazing the world design is, the greatly increased mechanical freedom you're afforded in traversal, the exploration is where the far more compelling stories are to be found. The path ahead is always an objective marker away, sure, but with every stop off the beaten path you take, every old world artifact you stop to examine, the resulting breadcrumb trail often ends up so labyrinthine, so potentially dangerous, so mechanically varied and satisfying, so jaw-droppingly beautiful, that even its most minuscule stealth encounters end up becoming delightful narratives of their own. It's a far cry from most open world games nowadays where objectives become mere checklists to run through, or even Sony's cinematic output where there's only one story being told and by god are you going to walk the one path to get there. Look, Horizon Forbidden West is just an astounding achievement. Outside of its story, which could have done with less of the exposition dumps, every aspect of your traversal through this world demands you admire it, but crucially, and where many games of its ilk falter, Forbidden West invites you to act in equal measure, to truly bask and play in the vastness and density of the space they've created. I almost never replay games after I make videos on them nowadays, but even in a month bursting with outrageously big name titles, all I want to do is return to this world to see what's left out there to discover. Horizon isn't a perfect title by any means, but its gameplay and world design bring back the freedom, curiosity, wonder and awe that the open world genre should and at one point did evoke, sensations that were gradually 
slowly, painfully buffed out from the genre, thanks to annualization necessitating ready-made templates to drag and drop more meaningless objectives onto. I expected nothing from Forbidden West, and in a way it still feels a little pointless to review it, but only because the one thing that really needs to be said is that I haven't been this enthralled by an open world game since Breath of the Wild. In a sea of absolute bland mush, Horizon Forbidden West rises above as something truly rejuvenating and vital. If you have a Sony console and like me you want something, anything to shake up the current state of open world gaming, you owe it to yourself to play this. Thank you all so much for watching, be sure to like, subscribe, turn on notifications, all that YouTube stuff, and check my podcast and Twitch links in the description. Most of all though, I have to thank my patrons for their unbelievably generous support. If you check out the community tab or Patreon feed, you can see some of my ideas for videos going forward. Videos I'm in the middle of working on right now, riskier ones that I simply would not have been able to consider were it not for the safety net your support gives me. Thank you all so much. If you've enjoyed any of the videos I've put out and want to join the many amazing people on screen helping the channel become more sustainable by supporting my work, you can directly help out as well as get things like access to completely ad-free video uploads, Q&As and now exclusive video content by heading to patreon.com slash writing on games and pledging only what you feel comfortable with. I am forever thankful for your support in whatever form it takes. Special thanks go to Mark B. Writing, Artyom Vitsyuk, Ben O'Sullivan, Charles J. Liu, Dan Murray, Gavin Casey, Alistair Dunn, Pitoutis Catarsis, Matthew Bowman, Ben Pace, David Carstens, New Static, Mike G, Tom Webster, Max Cohen, Dana Sikowskis, Christopher Faherty, Nicholas Villeneuve, Nelwyn Palacios, Ruth Natman, Yogesh Deshpande, Leah Cinello, Captain Knusprich, Bryce Snyder, Lucas, David Bjork, Winter, Timothy Jones, Matthew Grover, The Nameless Guy, Tommy Carver Chaplin, Dr. Motorcycle, Shardfire, Lynn Browning, Calliope Rannis, Spike Jones, Dallas Keane, Charlie Kimball, Jordan Midler, and Charlie Yang. And with that, this has been another episode of Writing on Games. Thank you all so much for watching, stay safe, and I will see you all next time.